the Sunday morning worship service. Let's all stand asking God's blessing in the service today. Father, we thank you so much for another beautiful day to come into your house and to, to worship you and to draw closer to you. We trust your blessing every part of this service this morning. Yeah. Give honor and glory to your name. And we'll praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Mary's going to come in peace. Thank the Lord for this beautiful Lord's Day. I believe this is Father's Day. Let's see, we're missing a few fathers. Other youngs, apparently still not able to drive. We're missing Charlie today. We're missing Bob Craig. So we got a few fathers absent from today, from our service today. So if you'll take your sing to the Lord, since this is Father's Day, we're going to begin our service by singing page 639, 639, Faith of Our Fathers, 639. <laughs> Page 603. 603. Jesus will walk with me.
promise that he will walk with us if we'll walk with him. Thank you for your sake. Let's go to prayer at this time. Just remember the spiritual needs of our church and our community. First of all, I'd like to thank the Lord for answering prayer about our general conference this week. We just came through. Everything went very smoothly. And you have a lot of voting and many, many issues for general conference. And you have unity. That means a lot. Amen. God really helped. And God really helped in conference. I want to thank you for answering prayer because he really did answer prayer. Uh, let's continue remember Brother Young. The Lord will continue to touch him in his physical needs. Bob Craig's not feeling well today. The Lord will touch him. If you remember the Brad Buzzard family, but the Buzzard passed away this past week. The funeral was Friday. Brother Nipset and I was able to go together to that funeral. And it's a very hurting family. They were very close to their dad. So let's remember the Buzzard family this time. Let's remember Peggy Peak, Sandy Grabo, and Lori Harrison with cancer. Uh, and his nephew Jason, any update on him? Okay. Let's continue to remember Dan Wolf's eye situation. He's lost his vision on the one eye, and the Lord will touch him. Uh, let's remember AWC's music groups as they travel throughout the summer. The Lord will make them a blessing, give them traveling mercies. Continue to remember our conference leaders and our missionaries. Brother Tiberio, he was supposed to speak Tuesday evening and he's having some serious physical problems and couldn't be there. So let's remember Brother Tiberio, is, he needs a real physical touch. If you remember our nation, if you remember Israel, uh, Ukraine, any other spoken requests this morning? Yes. Spoken requests and show me concerns on our hearts. I appreciate prayer for I have physical okay. requests. I appreciate prayer for that. Okay, let's all kneel and pray out together. <clears throat> Today is Father's Day. So if you're a father this morning, I'd like you to come up and take one of these candy bars. These candy bars are for to honor all our fathers that are here today. So don't be bashful. If you like candy like I do, you shouldn't be bashful. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my weaknesses. I, I know I could lose weight if I didn't like sweets, but <laughs> that's not the way I am. <laughs> yeah, German yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my. And 
Biblically and psychologically. We develop certain ideas about God because of various kinds of experiences with parents, particularly fathers. After all, we tell our children, God is our Heavenly Father. Like my own daughters, and I have three of them, they eventually made the connection. God who is an eternal spirit and invisible, gradually takes on the same characteristics in children's minds as an earthly father. You see, if a father is a kind and loving, in their mind, so is God, in the child's perception. If the father is cold and distant, even cruel, so God is too, is what in their thinking. See, Paul made it clear in his letters to Timothy and Titus, that a mark of maturity or immaturity in a man is the way he functions as a father in his home. His children particularly will reflect how well he has fulfilled this God-ordained role. If he's mature, Paul told Timothy, a man will be able to keep his children under control with all dignity, 1 Timothy 3, 4. Paul also told Timothy that this kind of father will have children who believe and you are not accused of dissipation or rebellion, Titus 1.6. Having a well-ordered household should be a goal for every Christian man. As fathers, we should never provoke our children to anger. Ephesians 6.4 reads, but bring them up in the discipline and the nurture of our Lord. Paul illustrated this concept with an illustration from his own ministry. Writing to the Thessalonians, Paul reminded them that he ministered among them as a father with his own children. He personalized his ministry by encouraging and imploring each one, which demonstrates how Paul viewed a father's ministry to each one of his own children, 1 Thessalonians 2.11. Christian fathers should rear not just a family, but individual children in that family. Every child has a different personality and needs individualized attention according to his or her own natural bent. This, I believe, is what Proverbs 22.6 means. It doesn't say train up your children. No, it says train up a child individually. Train up each child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. Shall we stand, please, in honor of God's Word? Proverbs 4, beginning at verse 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsaking not my law. For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. And my text this morning is verse 8. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring her to honor when thou dost embrace her. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for another privilege to call in your name, the privilege of reading your word and studying it and applying it to our daily living. We just trust you'll challenge each of us here today, help us to challenge each of the fathers that are here today to be the fathers you want us to be every day. And all that you do for us will praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. The father's role is that of authority. 
We must realize, however, that authority is always accompanied by responsibility. The emphasis in this message this morning is on paternal relationships with our children. You see, the father is to teach his children in the areas of morals, religion, and ethics. The task of teaching has been relegated to the mother, to the church, or perhaps to the public educational system. The book of Proverbs teaches, however, that it is also the responsibility of the father to teach his children. It says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, Proverbs 1.8. Just as the father, just as, just as the son must hear, so must the father teach. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father. Just as children are to hear, so the father is to instruct. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Training indicates the necessity of discipline through teaching. A child thoroughly taught never departs from such training. Children, then, for the most part, are true products of the home. Let's look at the curriculum. The father is to teach the divine word. He, the father, taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Proverbs 4.4 4. The word instilled in a child's heart results in true wisdom. She, wisdom, will exalt you, embrace her, and she will honor you, Proverbs 4.8. The child who is properly instructed walks in the right paths and does so without stumbling or without deviation, Proverbs 4.12. All these excellent results in a child's life and maturity hinge on the father's teaching. The father is to teach his children to be industrious. There's no such thing as a lazy Christian. There's, they don't exist. If you're lazy, you're not a Christian. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. Proverbs 10.5 Three ideas are before us here. Preparation, opportunity, and industry. A harvest comes as a result of preparation and hard work. Once the harvest is ready, one must be alert to seize the best opportunity for the ingathering. A son's ability to prepare, seize his opportunity, and practice industry stems largely from his father's example. Industrious fathers usually see the same characteristics in their offspring. The father is to correct, chasten, and train his children. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 29, 15. The teaching of Proverbs concerning child rearing is a contrast to the permissiveness of our day. And we can see it in our culture all around us. The father should teach by being a good example in the home. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs 13, 22. What the inheritance is, isn't stated. But we may assume it to be righteousness and character, since he is a good man. Children's children, or your grandchildren, are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Proverbs 17, 6. So let's look at the results. You see, when a father accepts the responsibility to teach his children, and when he teaches them the right thing, he may expect to see the following results. One, he will know the joy of a wise son. A wise son maketh a glad father. Proverbs 15, 20. My son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Proverbs 23, 15. His children will give him honor rather than shame and disgrace. Proverbs 23, 24. So in conclusion, we could say we have heard that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. We by no means should deny the important role of motherhood. However, Proverbs presents the father's role in child rearing as equally important. It is time for fathers to assume their responsibilities rather than neglecting them or de delegating them to others. 
It's not easy being a father. One cynic, speaking from his own experience, noted that children go through four fascinating stages. First, they call you Dada or Daddy. Then they, no, I'm sorry, Dada when they're first born. Then they call you Daddy. As they mature, they call you Dad. Finally, they call you Collect. <laughs> <laughs> Pre, let's look at the prerequisites to being a good father. First of all, being a man is number one. Functioning as a man is two. Taking responsibility as a man is three. Thinking like a man is four. Acting like a man is five. Working like a man is six. All of these are prerequisites to being a good father. You will not be a good father until you're a good man. You see, it's a dying art today in our culture. There are not many in our nation anymore. Thank God we do have some really good men here in our church, but we need a lot more of them here in Erie, by the way. We wouldn't have near the problems in Erie if we had a lot of good fathers all around Erie County. We, we, we would be much better off. All right. The men's thesaurus says the following. Men don't always say what they mean, ladies. Please allow me to translate for your future benefit. When a man says, it would take too long to explain, he actually means, I have no idea how it works. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, he means, oh, you're still talking? <laughs> when a man says, it's a guy thing, he actually means, there is no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance at all of making it logical. When a man says, can I help with dinner? He actually means, why is it already yet, ready yet? <laughs> when a man says, aha, sure honey, or yes dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's a condi conditional response. When a man says, I can't find it, what he means is, it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely clueless. When a man says, you look terrific to his wife, he actually means, oh, please don't try on one more outfit. We're late and I'm starving. When a man says, I don't think I can go today, he means shopping is not a sport. And no, I am never going to think of it that way. When a man says, that's not what I meant, he actually means, if something I said can be interpreted two ways, and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other one. If your husband says, honey, what color is this? He means all men see in only 16 colors, like Windows default settings. Peach, for example, is a fruit, not a color. Pumpkin is also a fruit, and I have no idea what tope is. We thank God today for the good men he sent us here in Erie, in our church. You see, good men are men who have learned to lean on the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I want to mention some do-nots for, for followers today. One is criticism. Near the top of most lists has to be criticism. In fact, a Christian writer of our day states the following, and I quote, Every year when our family decorates our Christmas tree, and I place a tiny red and green glass beaded wreath on the tree, I think of the little boy who gave it to me when I coached soccer. His sarcastic, demeaning father would run up and down the field, belittling his boy with words like, You chicken and woman. He was the only parent I ever told to be quiet or leave the field. I wonder sometimes how that boy, now a man, has fared. Winston Churchill had such a father in Lord Randolph Churchill. It's amazing Winston Churchill turned out to be anything. He, his dad did not like the books of Winston. He did not like his voice. He did not like to be in the same room with his, own, his son. He never complimented him, only criticized him. His biographers excerpt young Winston's letters begging both parents for his father's attention. 
I would rather have been apprenticed as a bricklayer's mate. It had been natural, and I should, should have got to know my father, unquote. Fathers who criticize their children often bring them to discouragement. The parallel version of this do not in Colossians 3.21 indicates that children embittered by nagging and deriding, they lose heart. Like a horse that has, has had its spirit broken. You can see it in a way a horse moves and you can see it in the eyes and posture of a disheartened child. Criticism comes in many ways besides overt words. Some parents never praise their children on principle. My praise will mean something when I give it, only they never give it. Then there is faint praise, backhanded praise, like that given to the boy who just scored a soccer goal. That was okay, son. Now next week, do better. Often it is not the words, it is the tone of voice or the distracted eyes which say it all to the child. Why are fathers so critical these days? Perhaps that is the way their fathers treated them. Perhaps they are simply critical people who mask it well in public, but cannot restrain themselves in the heat of domestic relationships in the home. To such fathers, God's word comes like an arrow headed for the bullseye. Do not exasperate or, yeah, your children with criticism. Second, over strictness. Some fathers exasperate their children by being overly strict and controlling. They need to remember that rearing children is like holding a wet bar of soap, too firm a grasp, and it shoots from your hand, too loose a grip, and it slides away. A gentle but firm hold keeps you in control. Kent Hughes states the following, and I quote, we cannot begin to estimate the ravages of over strictness on the evangelical Christian community over the years. I have had occasion in my ministry to bury people who live virtually all their 70 years in reaction to the harsh legalism of their upbringing. Lost bars no one could manage to pick up. Others were not so tragic. They came to renounce legalism biblically and theologically, but still wrestled with it emotionally for the rest of their lives. Why are some fathers so overly strict? And I run into some in my ministry. Many because they, they are trying to protect their children from an increasingly Philistine culture. And smothering rules seem the best way to accomplish that. Others are simply controlling personalities who use rules, money, friendship, or clout to rule their children's lives. The Bible read through their controlling grid because a license to own and to dominate. Still others wrongly understand their faith in terms of law rather than grace. We talked about God's grace in Sunday school this morning. Some men are overly strict because they're concerned about what others think. What will they think if my child goes to this place? Or wears this clothing? Or is heard listening to that kind of music? Not a few preacher's kids have been catapulted into rebellion because their fathers squeeze their lives to fit their parishioners' expectations. And that's really sad. We've lost a lot of young people from preachers' kids' homes. What a massive sin against one's children. Rather, we ought to begin our fatherhood by holding the tiny helpless bar snugly. But as it grows, gradually and wisely loosen our grip. As conscientious fathers, we have to say no to many things. Thus, we should try to say yes to as much as possible and save our nose for the really important situations. We must be biblical in regards to our nose and as our children grow, be prepared to discuss the rules biblically and principally. We must learn to trust God with our children, realizing they must learn to make decisions for themselves as they get older. Fathers, do not exasperate your children by being overly strict. Learn to hold their lives with God's pressure and to mold it with his love. Irritability. We have all seen it and perhaps done it. The father walks in the door after a pressured day, preoccupied with brow furrowed. His three-year-old comes running to him, but dad is busy unburdening himself to his wife. Just a moment, Jimmy. 
Jimmy tugs at his father's trousers, no response. He tugs again and his father explodes, picks him up and swats him hard for being rude. Only the Lord knows how many children lose heart because their fathers had a hard day. It's not the kid's fault that their dad had a hard day. Life is sometimes like the cartoon where the boss is grouchy toward a worker. His employee, in turn, comes home and is irritable with the children. His son then kicks the dog. The dog runs down the street and bites the first person he sees, the boss. We fathers must never let our pressures drive us into this unhappy cycle. The costs are way too high. Some say you treat your fellow men on the level, but when you're home with the wife and kids, you are mean as the devil. Your kids know. Inconsistency, this is so crucial. I've seen in ministry for over 40 years, people that are inconsistent with church attendance when the kids are growing up, and then when the kids turn 18, they never come back to church. Well, if, if you're not consistent when you're, you're raising your kids as they're in the nest, they're never gonna be consistent when they leave the nest. I don't understand people, men, parents thinking in this. It just bogs my mind. Few things will exasperate a child more than inconsistency. Pity the horse that has a rider who gives it mixed signals, digging his heels into its side and pulling the reins at the same time. Pity the child even more who has the rules changed by a capricious father and who is always exasperated because of the conflicting messages he receives. Fathers, you may forgive yourself by saying, oh, I'm just so busy. Memory isn't my thing. I'm just a spontaneous person, but your children will not see it that way. Be consistent. Never ever make a promise to your child and do not keep it. Do any unfulfilled promises come to mind? Horseback riding that never happened that you promised. Trips to the ice cream store or the ballpark. You may forget, but you have a little boy or girl who will remember it 80 years later. Favoritism, and this can be disastrous in a home. We read about this in the Old Testament. One of the most exasperating and damning sins a father can commit against his children is favoritism. Some children need more discipline. Some need more independence. Some need more structure. Some need less. Some need more holding than others. Some need more encouragement. But no child should be favored over another. Favoritism was the damning sin of Isaac, who favored Esau over Jacob. Ironically, it was also the damning sin of Jacob, who favored Joseph over his brothers. Like favoring father, like rejected son. How crushing, how disheartening to know that you are less favored or less loved than your parents. Men, the great do not of fatherhood is, do not exasperate your children, and life tells us what the resolving do nots of this are. Do not be critical, do not be over strict, do not be irritable, do not be inconsistent, and never show favor favoritism. You see, God has created our children with their hearts turned toward ours. Our power is awesome. We must take God's word to heart as we're trying to train them up the way they should go. Let's look at fatherhood's do's. The comprehensive do not A fatherhood is followed by the explicit do's. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord which, when fully understood, requires three do's, tenderness, discipline, and instruction. Let's look at the first one, tenderness. The word bringing them up means to nourish or feed, as in Ephesians 5.29, which is the same Greek word described, describing how man feeds and cares for his own body. Calvin translates bring them up, as let them be kindly cherished. And goes on to emphasize that the overall idea is to speak to one's children with gentleness and friendliness. Kent Hughes states the following, and I quote, When I was a teenager, my best friend's father was a man's man. He had spent 32 years in the Coast Guard as a non-commissioned officer. 
a chief Brazilian mate. He was a big man, and in his prime, he had put on the gloves with Joe Lewis. Officers greeted him first when he walked down the street. He could be rough and tumble. But do you know what he called his 265-pound son? David, dear. I was Kent, dear. And I did not mind at all. In fact, it made me feel great. He was not hung up on real men do not show affection. In fact, he still kisses his grown son, a man's man himself. We're to be tender. Men are never manlier than when they are tender with their children. Whether holding a baby in their arms, loving a grade schooler, or hugging their teenager or adult children. Here, a statement from the wise Christian philosopher Elton Trueblood is to the point, extending the principle further. A child, he says, and I quote, needs also to know that his father and his mother are lovers, quite and apart from their relationship to him. It is the father's responsibility to make the child know that he is deeply in love with the child's mother. There is no good reason why all evidences of, of affection should be hidden or carried on in secret. A child who grows up with the realization that his parents are lovers has a wonderful basis of stability. Tenderness, verbal and physical, comes naturally to a father living under God's word. Men, how do we measure up in this? Second, discipline. Next, there is training. This is a strong word which means discipline even by punishment. Pilate used the same word when he said of Jesus, I will punish him and then release him, Luke 23, 16. Discipline certainly includes corporal discipline as needed, but it encompasses everything necessary to help train up a child in the way he should go. The tragedy is that so many men have left this to their children's mothers. Not only is this unfair to the mother, but it robs the child of the security and self-esteem which come from being disciplined by their father. Men, do you leave the discipline of your sons and daughters to your wives? If so, that is a sad breach of domestic responsibility. You're not living under God's word. Third, instruction. Last, there's instruction, verbal instruction, verbal warning. The word instruction literally means to place before the mind. Often, this means to confront, and thus is related to the previous topic, discipline. This is precisely where the high priest, Eli, was such an abysmal domestic failure in raising his sons. 1 Samuel 3, 11 to 13 tells us, And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to the end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. The Greek word for restrain in the Septuagint has the same root as instruction in Ephesians 6, 4. Eli failed to confront his boys. He failed to instruct them about their sin. And because of this, they were destroyed. Clear, forthright instruction is necessary for a proper upbringing. Men, if we are to own up to our responsibilities, we must be involved in verbal, verbally instructing our children, regularly leading them in family devotions and prayer monitoring and being responsible along with our wives for the input that enters their impressionable minds, taking responsibility to help assure that church is a meaningful experience. And above all, we must make sure that the open book of our lives, our example, demonstrates the reality of our instruction. For in watching us, they will learn the most. I trust God will help us fathers to be everything we should be to our children, even after they are grown up and have left home. Shall we stand for prayer? Dale Hotchkiss, will you close in prayer, please?